Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 20th, 2016. I want to remind listeners to go to econtalk.org. And in the upper left-hand corner, you can vote for your favorite episodes of 2016 and share other feedback, which I really appreciate. Today's guest is the economist George Borjas. The Robert W. Scrivener Professor of Economics and Social Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. George has done extensive work in labor economics, in particular immigration, and today we'll be discussing his latest book, We Wanted Workers, Unraveling the Immigration Narrative. George, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you so much, for all, Ross. Like, you, know, you know, I don't know if you realize this, but it's almost 40 years that since the first time we ever met. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I do realize it. If somebody had told me that we'd be here today talking about this 40 years ago, I would have said, you know, not in your dreams, but somehow we're here, okay? Yeah, I don't like to think about it because that's so long ago. Uh, The other part, of course, that's hard to imagine and couldn't have been imagined is that we'd be talking not via phone but via Skype. I know. It would be recorded and it would be available to anyone around the world at zero uh, direct cost. It's a – Many, many good things in the last 40 years, at least for us. That's for sure. So let's start with the title of your book, which is uh, clever, We Wanted Workers. What is, where does that title come from? Okay, it comes from a quote by Max, from a statement by Max Frisch, who's a Swiss novelist, essayist, and he was reflecting on the immigrants, on the guest workers, really, that Europe tried to import uh, you know, the 1950s and 1960s, particularly Germany, but many other European countries as well. And those your, those guest workers came in and they clearly contributed to the economic miracle. For example, the post-German, the, the post-war German economic miracle, right? But uh, Max Frisch was looking at it from afar, and he basically said, uh, looking looking at it in a more general sort of way, we wanted workers, but we got people instead. And the reason that I picked that as sort of the one of the themes that I stress in the book is that even though I'm an economist, uh, I tend to be a little dissatisfied with the very mechanical way in which economists tend to view immigration. Uh, the typical, let me call it economistic way of looking at immigration, looks at them as a bunch of, as a bunch of robotic workers that you can basically move from place to place as the need arises. And that, I think, is what uh, Max Frisch was sort of referring to when he said we wanted workers. And it's true, immigrants play that role, okay? Uh, but the fact is that immigrants are human beings as well. And people make decisions. And people make decisions that are based on what is best for them. You know, they're rational human beings like you and I, right? And those decisions might or might not be precisely what the receiving country had in mind. And they may or may not uh, increase the benefits or they might, you know, they might actually create some harm along the way. The point is that the the fact that that immigrants are something beyond workers and that they play a role that is not just this robotic kind of role of moving from factory to factory means that we have to look at the impact of immigration in a much broader framework. We have to take immigrant decision making into account in particular. And uh, that, I think, was one of the things that motivated me. I mean, it really was one of the themes that motivated me as I was trying to write this book, you know, easy to explain way for a general reader, that we have to look at immigration, not just, I mean, let me put it a different way, too. Uh, a lot of people make the analogy between immigration and trade. Uh, and in fact, uh, immigration is like trade to some extent. You know, when we import a widget, it's a point they make in the book. It's sort of like importing the raw labor that creates that widget, only that we're importing the raw labor, they will allow us to create the widget domestically, right? Uh, but the fact of the matter is that when widgets break down, we can throw them out. Uh, when immigrants break down or get sick or things happen, we have a responsibility. And that is one crucial way in which immigration is not like trade. 
And that's sort of the, the, the thematic content of what that statement that I was trying to capture in the book. Yeah, well, I think th- we'll come back probably to that analogy uh, between trade and immigration, which, of course, they're both related to open borders. If you have open borders, you can choose to have open borders for goods. You can have choose, choose to have open borders for capital. You can choose to have open borders for people. And s- the impact of those different cases are have some similarities. And as you point out, they also have some differences. So um, I think it's interesting how hard it is for people to think about those clearly, even economists, even myself. Um, let's start with a let's start with a um, a standard argument you hear that you uh, attack in the book uh, correctly, I believe. People often say, well, we have to have immigrants because if we don't, there will be no one to do the certain types of jobs. Americans, right. quote, Americans won't do these jobs, whether it's mowing That's lawns, right. painting, basic construction, agriculture work in particular, which these are all areas that often have a lot of immigrant workers. Uh, what's wrong with that argument? Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, the, the usual phrase is immigrants do jobs neighbors don't want to do. And uh, the problem with the basic argument is that it sort of ignores the role of markets and the role of incentives. Uh, I think the correct statement is really immigrants do jobs neighbors don't want to do at the going wage. The presence or absence of immigrants basically cre- changes the market. And markets react to either to people coming in or people going out. Uh, the, the way I start this in the book, as you know, is by describing a little anecdote uh, of a firm in Georgia back in 2006 where uh, the Bush, at the time the Bush administration was trying to look serious about enforcing immigration policy regarding illegal immigration. And they actually conducted quite a few raids on firms of higher illegal immigrants at the time. And one of the raids happened to be on a firm called Kreider in Georgia, a, a chicken processing plant. And uh, the nice thing about this example is that, you know, Kreider did precisely what we would teach uh, uh, profit-maximizing, rational kind of firm to do. Chrysler basically, uh, uh, Kreider basically woke up on after Labor Day weekend finding that three quarters of its workforce had been basically, had disappeared because of the raid. And, you know, what, do, what does Kreider do at that point? Well, they put an ad in the paper. And the ad they put in the paper is increased wages. We want worker at increased wages. You know, less supply, uh, higher wages. Uh, so to me, it's, it's not surprising that uh, markets respond in the way that common sense tells you they respond. What I've always really find, found very puzzling about the immigration context and the supply and demand issue is that most of us have no trouble, uh, you know, given our training, we have no trouble saying supply and demand is a very nice sort of unifying tool through which to explain why prices go up and down. And somehow that idea tends to disappear from a lot of people's minds, a lot of economists' minds, when it comes to immigration. And I've always found it a little, uh, found it a little puzzling. I mean, I don't quite know why there's a resistance to accepting that prices will change when supply shifts. But in the case of immigration, you tend to see the resistance quite often. Yeah, well, I'd be in that group to some extent. So let's let's get into that because I think that's a central issue with, that we should talk about. You know, first on the Kreider example in Georgia, uh, it's not surprising that overnight finding that you're out of workers, you're going to pay more. The more interesting question would be six months, a year, and two years later, uh, was that just an emergency move on their part or was that a response to the fact that there was suddenly a, a smaller supply of – of workers of low skill to that particular area of the country, and normally wouldn't expect the loss of a hundred workers in a in a town or a city or a state or a country to have a big impact on wages. It's a small change, but that had a big change. It was observable partly because it was uh, they had a very you know, urgent short run demand for workers. But the more general question, I guess, is the following, and I and I I want to phrase it in a. It's hard to phrase it because. I'm a big fan of supply and demand. Of course, the question is supply and demand of what? Uh, labor with capital L, low-skill labor, high-skill labor, uh, labor that has a particular kind of skill. Certainly all those things are going to have uh, 
impacts on how you use supply and demand and whether you use it uh, carefully. I guess the question I would have is that when we talk about labor generally, if we said, for example, uh, if we tried to imagine, do the following experiment, which is the kind of experiment you do in your work, what if the United States had not liberalized immigration uh, in the last 25 years, which it, uh, which it has, last 30 years, I guess, right? Post-1990 is the key when it started to become more liberal, so a little before that. But I think post-1990 is, is, has been a relatively liberal era for open, open borders. Do you want to think about that as an L, a supply and demand for labor? Uh, or do you worry about the fact that it depends on what kind of workers they are? It depends on whether they're complementary uh, or substitutes. Does it depend on what parts of the country they go in? It just seems like a, a little more complicated than just the supply and demand for labor. Oh, I completely agree, Ross, okay? I mean, one of, one of the things in my work over the last 10, 15, 20 years has been that you really have to match the skills of immigrants to the skills of natives if you want to sort of detect an impact. Uh, a lot of the literature has gone the wrong way, basically because, um, you know, the, the matching is not quite proper. I mean, I'll give you an example of this in some work that I've done on mathematicians, which I sort of talk a little bit about in the book. Uh, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 1990s, 1992 or so, right? And a bunch of mathematicians came to the U.S. Now, from an outside perspective, you'd see the supply of mathematicians increasing, right? Uh, but it turned out that the, the mathematicians who came to the U.S., happen to specialize in particular topics. And so if you were to look at the average mathematician in the U.S. who actually worked on very different kinds of topics, you would see actually very little impact. But if you look at the mathematicians in the U.S. who specialize in the topics that mathematicians the Soviet Union had specialized in, then you detect the negative impact of supply and demand, that the, 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 the sort of the basic supply and demand framework will give you. So... I, you know, I, I am very appreciative of the fact that you really have to very carefully match who it is that the immigrants are going to hit first. Because, that, as you said, there's complementarities involved as well. For better or worse, and I think it's for worse actually, much of the literature has focused way too much on trying to measure the own impact. In other words, trying to detect that when the, the group of a particular skill uh, the number of that group goes up, uh, the wage might go down in the short run. And again, another important distinction, short run versus long run. In the short run, that's the theory is very clear about that. And in, in the theory, it's also clear that in the long run, what's going to happen is capital will adjust. And in a constant return to world, the average wage should return to what it was pre-migration. But that doesn't mean that even in the, in the long run, there are no distributional impacts. Those groups that had a relatively larger supply shock in terms of more workers will tend to be a little worse off than those, those groups that had a smaller supply shock. So all of these things come into the picture when one tries to estimate this impact. And that is partly the reason why the literature is actually very confusing. Different people are trying to estimate different things. Short run, long run confusion enters into the picture. And again, uh, from the point of theory, the short run, long run distinction is very clear. From the point of data, it's far less clear because we don't really know what the long run would be in a labor market hit by a supply shock. Would it be a day? Would it be a year, 10 years? We don't really know that. Nobody has really ever analyzed the dynamics of what happens to the labor market as a result of a supply shock. And then we also have to deal into the skill issue, which means that uh, how you how do you find skill groups could be very problematic because uh, you know at some point there's an arbitrary nature to defining a school group like for example in my work I've defined it in terms of education and, and age basically in a lot of what I've done well you know uh, there's education there's education right yeah it's, it's a good place really to start clear that, yeah go ahead no it's a good place to start but obviously. Somebody with four, two people, each with, say, four years of education and a college degree may have very different skills. And one may compete with one type of worker, but not at all with another type. So, Exactly. That's what I'm trying to point but out. I, so, yeah. I, I want to take us in a 
let's take this point more generally because I think it comes up a lot in uh, lots of different areas of labor economics. It drives me crazy when people say um, uh, Seattle passed a living wage ordinance and employment in Seattle is doing fine. Well, <laughs> most people in Seattle are not going to be affected by the minimum wage. It's only going to be the people down toward the lower end of the scale distribution. And you have to look at those workers to see if there's any impact because otherwise the overall impact is going to get lost in the noise of, of particularly if there's growth in the Seattle area, which there is doing very well. So it's hard to know whether there's any effect. But if, if you're trying to measure it, you certainly don't want to look at, say, employment of all workers um, because the theory doesn't expect that to change very much if only a small proportion of workers are, are affected by the minimum wage. And I think similarly – uh, you, if, if more low-skill workers come in into the United States, you and I are not going to be uh, very affected on the wage side. We're going to be affected on the price side. It's going to be probably good for us, actually, because many of the things we buy might get cheaper as a result. But if uh, hundreds of thousands of economists uh, came in from the Soviet Union, that could affect our wage. And certainly if it had happened 20 years ago, it would be affecting our wage today. Uh, as long as they could teach what we teach roughly, uh, research what we research approximately. And uh, so I, the basic point is, is, you know, is undeniable that certainly you have to be careful. One of the things that one of the things that comes through in your book very clearly is how hard it is to make those kind of measurements, given that our data are imperfect. As you point out, we don't have uh, people don't walk around saying uh, with a sign on them saying I'm a substitute for such and such a kind of worker. You have to inevitably make assumptions. Um, you made one just a minute ago in passing. You mentioned the phrase constant returns. That's a certain assumption about how capital and labor combine, and it may be a decent approximation. It may not be for a particular city or state or a time period when you're trying to measure the impact. That's exactly right. Actually, there's two, two, two things I want to say to, your, to, to what you just said, okay? One is the role of assumptions is huge, and we don't appreciate that. In, you know, we, don't, we don't emphasize that enough when we discuss the labor market impact of immigration, sort of what, what the general findings are. And like this whole day, I mean, a lot of people, and I sort of cite in the book some examples, claim that the data has shown that on average, the immigration has no impact in the long run on wages, right? And that is true, that's what the papers show. What the discussion doesn't usually emphasize is that that has been assumed by the constant returns assumption. The fact that on the average, zero, the, the impact of immigration on the average wage is zero is, has nothing to do with data. It's all been built in by the fact that there's a, a model underlying this analysis that assumes constant returns. And the other point you raise, which is, also, again, extremely uh, relevant in this context, is the minimum wage example. You raise it in the context of, you know, you have to really match who is being affected by the minimum wage or not, right? I want to raise it in a different context, which is a lot of people make what I what, what, what is in terms of pure theory completely contradictory arguments when it comes to immigration and, and when it comes to the minimum wage. Somehow you see people who have no qualms whatsoever saying immigration in the short run doesn't have an effect on wages. And at the same time, they say the increase in the minimum wage has no effect on employment. In the short run, you know, as you know, those two things are completely contradictory. In the context of the minimum wage, they're basically claiming that the labor market, the labor demand curve is perfectly inelastic. In the context of immigration, they're claiming that the labor demand curve in the short run is perfectly elastic. You know, one of those things, and probably both are, in, are wrong. Labor demand curves are probably not in that, in either extreme. And uh, it's really sort of, I've always been fascinated by the intellectual contradiction in sort of claiming these two things simultaneously. Well, here's the other question I have on this, and then we'll move to some other examples and then try to summarize some of the empirical work and get to this. I think we'll want to reemphasize this point about assumptions because I think it's very clear. So um, workers aren't widgets. Uh, they're not the same. Importing workers is not the same as importing the goods that workers overseas might produce, partly because workers bring their cultural habits that, and that's obviously an issue that you talk about in the book. But they also bring the fact that they, they want to buy things, right. uh, so which makes them not like a widget. So in general, if you ask me, is the increase in the U.S. population uh, between, say, 1900 and 2000, has that been good or bad for workers? Uh, we wouldn't want to use a supply and demand model because the supply and demand model are, is a 
the technical term is it's partial equilibrium. And partial equilibrium is probably not the right way to simply think about uh, – it simplifies what's going on when we think about a growing population. So that's the problem I have when I think about uh, an increase, say, in immigration. To me, it's it's a lot like an increase in population. It, it's true you bring in adults rather than infants usually. Uh, but obviously, it's a little more complicated than just saying, well, there's a supply shock. I'm willing to accept the fact that in the short run, that could certainly be the case for workers with skills who are close to the workers who are coming in. That's going to be hard on them in the short run. Of course, they already have jobs. Their wages aren't – a lot of them, their wages are not going to go down instantaneously with the opportunities to hire additional workers that come with more immigration. So I'm not quite – explain to me how the supply and demand framework should be used in, say, a case like population or immigration and, and, and why yeah. it's different. It seems to me it's very different from the minimum wage. No, I agree with you. Okay, in the long run, we have, it's much more of a. What does it do? To, I mean, in the long run, the, the real question is what does it do to economic growth? What does having a lot more people do to economic growth? Right. Yep. And, and uh, the question that becomes: What do you want to assume of the underlying technology? Say that again. What do you want? What? The question becomes: What are you going to assume about the underlying technology? Correct. Okay. And if you assume constant returns, you know, then you're not going to, you know, pro, not, not, not much will happen in terms of per capita income. In the long run. And therefore, how do you explain? And you, the, the, that's probably not a very good – that's not a good starting place. No, no, but, but therefore, uh, the question is, did immigrants completely replicate what we have now? Or is the skill distribution of immigrants different from what we had originally? And then it will depend on factor proportions, I think. So I, I'm going to disagree with – let me agree with half of that and let me disagree with the other half. Okay. <laughs> Even though it's maybe only one half there, but – Okay. Uh, it's certainly true. Let's suppose uh, we take a country like the United States at a point in time, and now we're going to increase the population via immigration by 20 percent. It's a huge increase, okay. big, big increase. Let's and, actually double it. It's actually easier to think about. Okay, double. great. Let's double, double it. Double the population. And I'm going to think of, of, of two, three different cases. In case number one, the, the skill set – and I'm ignoring the cultural side of this for now, obviously. We're only going to look at the economic impact. Okay. financial monetary impact on wages and markets. So obviously if everybody's the same, excuse me, if the distribution of the new people mimics is almost exactly the same as the current distribution, we'll have doubled everything. We'll have doubled all the low-skill workers, all the high-skill workers. That's and the case, long run capital should double as well. Because? Because, the, you know, in a global, you have to, okay, now you have to say, well, the rate of return to capital will increase in the U.S. as a result of the initial people coming in, right? Right. That will bring in additional capital somehow. Maybe from overseas. Maybe people save more. Exactly. Maybe okay. So and that's then case you number have one. Have another brand new U.S. next to the old U.S. Right, and it's twice as big. It's got twice as much capital. Twi well, we don't know if it has twice as much, but it has more capital, and more labor. Yeah. Next question. Okay. Next question. The, the second case would be. But, but the point is, in that scenario, per capita income doesn't really change. Uh, well, we don't know that exactly. I think we do. I don't think we do. The reason I'd say that is that I actually think there's uh, – um, V. Adam Smith, the, the division of labor is, is limited by the extent of the market. Oh, but, but I'm thinking of a very specific production function here. I know, and I don't think that way. I don't find okay, that – I find that, that. <laughs> But that goes back to the beginning of what I said. It all depends on yeah. what you assume about the production. That's fine. Technology. So let's leave let's leave that alone for the moment. Let's accept the fact that different assumptions about how people combine could affect the final conclusion. But it certainly wouldn't be the case, and you wouldn't argue the case that in the long run, all those extra workers would lower wages for the people who already live here. Uh, it, it could in the short run. It could because for a lot of reasons, and it certainly could measure. Well, I mean, that's case one. Case two, uh, we double the population, but every single person who comes is below the median or the average, one or the other, in their right. skill level. And case three is they're all above the median or the average of the skill level. And the question would be how different are those case two and three from case one? That is obviously they're different, right? They're not the same. Oh, definitely. definitely. So you want to speculate about that for a minute? Well, I tell you, uh, I think about it this way. Uh, in, the, in the first case, it's very clear what will happen. You just have a brand new U.S. next to the old U.S. Everything doubles. Per, I should say per capita GDP doubles. 
per, uh, I'm sorry, total GDP doubles per capita GDP doesn't change. And whenever, when, when we just replicate ourselves, not much happens with constant returns. When we don't replicate ourselves, what's going to happen is uh, capital will still adjust, right? In the long term, capital should still adjust, but there will now be a different factor proportion than what we had originally. And what I would think would happen in terms of a very simple-minded model of, you know, of, of long-run growth, right? What, you, what, you, what I think will happen is that the, the group that the group that encountered the higher wage, the higher supply increase, will tend to have relatively lower wages than the group that encountered the least supply increase. So, for example, in the, one of the examples you said, suppose a lot of the immigrants or most of the immigrants or all the immigrants are low skill. The few low skills workers we had in the U.S. are going to have relatively lower wages, but the high skill workers have become primarily involved in this production technology, right? right? The high skill workers are going to be much better off. Yep. And so, yeah. but, but look, but that's actually raising an important point. Once you go away from this very simple minded replicating ourselves model, you recognize immediately there will be distributional impacts, and that introduces the notion of trade offs into immigration discussions. You know, not everybody will be better off. It's true that it may well be that the that the the, 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 in, the economic pie accruing to the original population might increase, but it doesn't increase equally for everybody, right? Correct. Yeah, but this, but this, this, that's this for sure. Of the pie. That's mm-hmm. for sure. I agree with that yeah. 100%. But it seems to me that the simple short run story misses a key, a key thing. So I'm going to I'm going to shift gears no, on no, you. No. Before you leave this, I yeah, completely yeah. agree with you. I mean, the correct way of looking at this, I mean, I think both things matter, okay? Because oh, I agree. Sure one, and I agree with that. You know, sure one's not irrelevant. So yeah, exactly. that'll, that'll be clear from this next example. So if I exactly. said to you, um, we don't, but until recently, we let's say we didn't trade with China, either because they were so poor or because transportation costs were too high, whatever the reason is, doesn't matter for this example. And now suddenly we're trading a lot with China, which is what happened between roughly over the last 20 years. We've, we've right. increased our trade with China dramatically. I have no doubt that that was harder on people who made things that – who had the skills that were similar to the skills of people in China than it was on me who – there are true, there are Chinese right. professors who come here and Chinese academics and Chinese economists. But in general, it's relatively small. And so I've benefited tremendously from increased trade with China because my clothes are less expensive and so on. My toys – gadgets, et cetera. And clearly, a lot of people haven't benefited as much. In fact, they may even been hurt on that. It's true. They also get to buy cheaper clothes and cheaper gadgets, but they have, unfortunately, might not have a good job anymore. That's uh, they might not have any job. Right. They might not have any job, again, in the short run, and that short run might be fairly long. So we don't want right. to say, you know, these, the term short run, long run are kind of Shorthand ways for saying it's more complicated, but we all understand if we're thoughtful what those complications are. Now, if you said to me, therefore, there's distributional consequences of trade with China, we certainly agree 100 percent. If you want to – but I would never suggest that trade with China in the United States is like something like akin to a wash for the wages or well-being or standard of living in the United States. I'd say in the short run, it's harder on people who, who have uh, those skills, but because of the gains to all the rest of the folks – those people now have more purchasing power, and they can, are going to demand and create and produce more things. Are going to be created things more things are going to be created and produced using the opportunity now that things are cheaper coming in from China, and therefore lower skill workers who were hurt initially, they may get benefits that are not seen, and in, and in addition, their children and grandchildren will live in a much better world potentially because we are using our resources in the world more effectively. And I would think the same thing would be true of, tra- of immigration. Look, uh, let me let me actually do make two points about what you just said, right? I mean, I think it's a really nice thing to sort of compare the analogy you made on trade with an, a similar a similar example with immigration. Okay, first of all, suppose that instead of trade with China, we had gotten a lot of immigrants, and they tend to be very low skill immigrants. Okay, and uh, that would mean the same thing that you said about the people being hurt by the Chinese imports. Yep. Some people will be hurt by the low skill immigrants. And you and I would gain tremendously. We can buy all kinds of stuff cheaper. We can hire people to clean our house, fix our roofs and stuff like that, right? Yep. Uh, and you can actually show from, you can show from the simple economic model that both in the case of trade you had in mind, 
And in the case of immigration that I'm putting forward as an, as an analogy, the economic pie accruing to natives increased, right? Yep. And their, their, their pie increased and, the, and the, the split shifted, okay, changed. The, the way the pie's divided, yeah. The, okay, to natives. And then the question is, how much weight should we put to the fact? And this is a value question now. How much weight should we put to the fact that many people perhaps are much worse off right now than they would have been otherwise. You made an implicit judgment, as you said, well, in the long run, my children, grandchildren, and so on, we're much better off, and therefore, I'm going to ignore all this in a little bit. Oh, but not just mine. Also, the, uh, my point was much broader than that. My point is that the children and grandchildren of the low-scale workers who are hurt in the in the current world by Chinese trade, they're going to inherit a better world because we've well, grown the what's pie. What's a better world? What's a better world if your father doesn't have a job? And can barely afford, you know. I mean, I don't. I see. That's where. That's where you and I depart. Okay. I, I can, I'm not willing to. I'm not willing to go into the next step because I don't know what a better world would be. So you're telling me, are you? But that means you're telling me that when we decide to open our borders to Chinese goods, we should not. We should be very wary of the fact that American worker. And by the way, this is also true of innovation. Right. So it's that's not just analogy. it's not just it's not just trade. If we have technological improvement that makes some people's skills obsolete, and their parent and they're not going to have a job, their children and grandchildren are going to live in a much better world, which is the history of the last hundred years of the United States. Okay, you show me evidence that in fact the children and grandchildren of people hurt by immigration or trade are way better off than they would have been otherwise. I'm willing to buy into that. I mean, to me, that sounds like an ideological argument more than a factual argument. And let me tell you the other thing that, that you raised in your question, which is to say, yes, there will, be a, a, there will be an increase in the economic pie. But this is where the distinction between workers and people comes in very, very nicely, okay? In the case of trade, the increase in the economic pie accruing to natives happens, and it's there, no doubt about it. In the case of immigration, it's not so clear, because suppose that a lot of the immigrants who came in have been low skill. Well, they're going to have impacts. Just see, forget all the other stuff that might go on. Just look at the welfare state impact. The welfare state impact is not trivial, and it may well be that the expenditures that they uh, trigger on the welfare state could easily offset the gains that accrue from them being like like widgets in a sense, right? And that's why it, it is entirely possible for globalization through trade to actually increase the economic pie and for globalization through immigration to not increase the economic pie at all. Okay, so that's a, that's a relevant that – is, that is relevant. That's a, that's a relevant point, but let me just answer your charge that I made an ideological claim. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the argument that I made a, a logical claim uh, through the logic of economics, and I'll give you some evidence. Uh, my evidence would be the following. In 1900, the average standard of living in uh, the United States was a fraction of what it is now. Uh, it's, uh, it's probably something like – something between 10 and 30 times higher. Of course, it's very difficult – it's impossible to measure precisely because so many products – we try right. to figure out the purchasing power of an income today <laughs> versus income in 1900. Those products were simply not available in 1900. There's no elegant or, or precise way to deal with that reality. Put that to the side. No one disputes that our, our, our material well-being today dwarfs what it was 100 years ago. Now, what happened over those 100 years is that we had an immense amount of creative destruction, and it had, came from three different sources. We had – Tremendous technological change. We had a huge increase in globalization of goods and capital. We had a huge increase in, in, in immigration and mobility. We also had population change. And along – so uh, hundreds of millions, may, maybe – well, just I'll leave it at hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions of jobs were destroyed over that century, over the last hundred years. And new jobs were created. Now, you can argue it's certainly the case that many of the individuals – who were hurt by those three changes of, immigra of immigration, technology, and trade uh, were harmed at the time. But I think it would be hard to argue that their children and grandchildren were harmed. They live much better material lives through the process of creative destruction, through the process of growth. You could argue it wasn't worth it, but my claim would be that a, a farmer living in 1900, when 40 percent of the workers were on the farm, today it's 2 percent in the United States – that farmer's children and grandchildren are much better off, even though the changes that caused that to happen were very tough on farmers in the meanwhile. They had to – they couldn't cover their mortgage. Their prices went down because of competition and increased innovation in agriculture and economies of scale. 
and small farmers in particular went bankrupt, and they had a tough time, and their children had to suffer through the fact that their parents didn't have a job, and their farm was out of business, et cetera. Their farm was bankrupt. But I think overall, it's been a pretty good run. You going to disagree with that? No, not at all. I mean, I've actually made that argument myself sometimes, okay? So I, mean, I completely agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, but the point, uh, look, the, the, there's a lot of things going on over the last century, right? So to, to Fair sort enough. Of, you know, and so who knows? What, it's very hard to disentangle all these effects. What I think uh, has been something that we economists have been guilty of is the following. When we teach trade and immigration in class, we always point out the models create these benefits and costs, right? Even though the pie might increase. Yep. Uh, when you talk about trade and immigration in the public debate, you know, on public policy, especially with trade, you don't hear much about the cost. Yeah, I agree with you there. That's disgusting. You know? And yep. that's, uh, that's actually been, that's been a very destructive part of what we've done as a profession, I think, because some people do get hurt. And people getting hurt and being left behind and being ignored has consequences, has social consequences, has political consequences. And, you know, we're in a world now where we might be living through those consequences. Now, I agree with that. And I, I, I actually, I agree with it very strongly. I think it's incredibly uh, depressing how advocates for and against uh, both sides of these issues are dishonest and don't admit right. to various costs and benefits, uh, depending on which side you're on. Everybody's selling a free lunch. Um, and yeah, that, that, that was the – thank you for saying that. That was the, one of the things I wanted to get in my book. There are trade-offs in everything, right? Yep. You know, and immigration totally is one of those things. I'm willing I, – I, even though I'm more of an open borders guy than you are, George, I certainly agree with it. And your book made me think about it more than I have, which I really appreciate. And it also reminded me of something I, I'm very uh, much in agreement with, which is the tendency for advocates to cherry-pick data – uh, on both sides of this debate and avoid right. those costs. I cert- 100%. So let's let's talk about the uh, a little bit about the measurement of those costs. Uh, what would you argue in, is the best estimate, uh, at least in the short run, and the short run could be long, uh, right. of the of the harm to Native American low skilled. Uh, native workers of low skills, that is high school dropouts, right. even high, high school graduates from the recent increase in immigration. And by the way, the other thing that drives me crazy is everyone just assumes that everything's linear. So if we made it twice as big, the fact would be the same. Or if we right. do it now versus 50 years ago, it doesn't matter. They're, of course, they're all – and you point out many times in the book very well – so you have to be you have to be careful about historical context, the types of workers, the countries they come from. Those are all relevant. So, talk okay. about what we know about the impact on low skill workers in America when immigrants uh, come in. Look, the, the number I carry in my head is that uh, what we've seen in the last twenty, thirty years has basically been something on the order of like a twenty, twenty five percent increase in supply at the bottom end of the of the skill distribution. I think the best available number is that that has basically increased the, the – has lowered the wage at the bottom of the skill distribution by something between 3 and 5 percent, which is not a huge amount. I mean, it's not a huge impact by any means, but it's not zero. Agreed. And, uh, you know, and the question is how much attention should one put when one thinks about immigration on that particular loss? And that's really much more of a value question than it is an economic question. I mean, what I'm trying to resolve in the book is to sort of point out to people that, yes, you can cherry pick data and you can do this and you can do that. But overall, there's some evidence that pe- the people who are most affected, once you define things properly, people who are most affected by immigrants who look just like you are going to be hurt a little bit. But i tell you one thing that, that I don't do enough in the book and that people don't do enough generally, uh, it sort of it comes back to something that we talked about earlier. You know, those losses come along with complementarities. And we've not really put much attention on, on, on measuring the gain that you and I get as a result of the low skill immigration. And those, those gains could be substantial. And that too is part of what the debate should be about. Well, your point about the, let's say it's 5%, it does remind me that for low-skill workers in America, the last 
25 years have been very challenging for three reasons. Uh, and we've mentioned them all. One is the increase in in immigration of low-skill workers. The second is technology, the increase in artificial intelligence, computerization, et cetera. And the third, of course, is trade. All three of those right. with with a trade with countries who have a lot of low-skill workers. Right. Uh, so They've got should, hammered. Yeah. They've so, got hammered. so this explains – why there are there are a lot of folks in certain parts of the country who aren't doing very well, and um, and it's uh, it's a serious issue. So l- let me let's not debate whether five percent is small or large. I, I wouldn't debate it. It's small to some and large to many. And if but if you're one of those workers, it's large. I assume uh, if you're poor, five percent's not a trivial amount potentially. It seems to me the the right policy response to that is not to keep out. Uh, low skill workers. It's not to reduce innovation. It's not to keep out products from countries with low skill workers. It's to try to improve the skill set of the workers who are here. Try to encourage them to finish high school. Um, it seems to me a very strange policy idea to say we have to keep out workers from, say, Mexico or Latin America because uh, they compete with American dropouts and they they get hurt. Shouldn't we try to just improve our school system and our or culture to get people to graduate high school? Uh, okay, that's, that's actually a great point. And my usual answer to that is twofold. One is who pays for that? And because, you know, in, in providing educational opportunities to many, many more people is not, you know, there's not a free lunch, right? Somebody right. will have to pay for that. Yep. And I don't know what the estimates of that will be, but I would like to know before you make a decision as to what the right thing to do would be, what would be the cost of doing that, right? Yep. And then the second thing that's always puzzled me about this, and I've never really thought it through completely because I haven't had the time to sort of sit down and work out a model, is sort of related to what you said. A lot of people say, look, it's true that, or it may be true that the bottom end has gotten hammered because of immigration and so on. But one good thing about all this is that it's encouraged them to go back to school and get more education, right? And there's some kind of upgrading, skill upgrading, they call it, or something along those lines. And one thing, one way to look at it is that way. Another way to look at it is the following. These people decided uh, before the supply shock that the optimal thing they should do was to get X schooling and no more. And now this is a shock out of their own control that they now have to revisit that maximization problem. And they have to incur the cost of moving away from whatever they had picked before to some other equilibrium, right? Is that an optimal way to to run it? You know, to for, for is that an optimal thing that should come out of immigration policy to force quote unquote force people who had already pre decided that they didn't want to do certain things to make them do them? And I've never seen anybody sort of discuss this very clearly. And uh, you know, in in, on, in the abstract, we can all say, of course, we can just get everybody. You know, let's make it, let's make everybody go to college. You know, let's 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 do all that. But a lot of people don't want to do that. And how do you compensate those people who don't want to do that uh, through the fact that you're now changing the environment in a way that they have to do something they didn't want to do? Yeah, I think the, instead of saying force, I would say incentivize. But but it's the same point, right? Uh, yeah. Do we want to incentivize people to go to college, say, who don't want to go now, et cetera? I think the key point in answering that, and the, we don't know the answer precisely at all, but – Key point would be it's not just that they're going to be incentivized to go to college. It'll be – or to say in high school, say, and graduate. Right. The key point is that with more workers uh, and more people, presumably there's more – and if there is if there is economic growth as a result and more capital coming in, the opportunities and the return to going finishing high school and going on to college will be higher than they were before. Just as you mentioned that before, that those new workers coming in are be complementary – to, right. to say to our skills, of course, the question right. is how much and how big. George, talk for yeah. talk for a minute about uh, your personal story, and because okay. uh, it's very interesting, and I think listeners will probably guess that you were an immigrant, uh, right. and that uh, your experience affected your interest in this topic. And I think that's a that's a it's a small part of the book, but it's a very interesting part. And uh, talk about that for a little bit. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I tell you, I, I, you know, I was born in Cuba. And my family used to own a small clothing factory. They manufacture men's pants. And like I say in the book, I'm actually one of those rare economists that spent a lot of time inside a factory with capital and labor. 
the manufacturer product that was sold in the marketplace. So I've, I've actually seen that firsthand, okay? Yeah. And uh, so uh, the, manufa- the factory was confiscated very soon after Castro took over. And uh, basically, you know, my father was very ill throughout my childhood. And there were rumors that Castro was going to ship out all the children to the countryside and re-educate them or something. My family wanted to get me out of the country, at, you know, no matter what it involves. But my father basically got sicker over that period and eventually passed away, and that always disrupted these plans. My mother and I eventually were able to migrate uh, in October 62, just a week before the missile crisis closed the border with Cuba. So I was very, very lucky in being on one of those last flights. Uh, many years go by, and uh, so I'm, you know, I'm an immigrant, obviously. I, you know, I'm sort of predisposed to immigration topics. And I'm a Columbia graduate student of Columbia. This is a few years before we met at, you know, in Chicago, right? Yep. And uh, Barry Cheswick comes by and gives a paper. And that paper is an assimilation. That paper is actually now, you look back on it, and it's sort of the foundation of the beginning of immigration economics in the modern era, sort of the, the paper that sparked the whole, the whole field. And uh, his claim was, uh, well, his finding was that if you look at immigrants who just arrived in the U.S. and compare them to immigrants who've been here a long time, the immigrants who just arrived earn a lot less than those who've been here a long time. And then he proceeded to interpret that finding as a proof of economic assimilation. Uh, that the longer you're here, the more you learn whatever it is you have to learn, the language, the American way of life, whatever, right? The American yep. way in the labor market and you improve your human capital in some sense. At that seminar, I asked a question that clearly came from my own background. And it happened to be because I knew that the Cuban flow was composed of two distinct waves. Those who came like myself before 62, and those who came many years later. And there were very many rumors or observations in the Cuban community that those who came before 62 were the entrepreneurs, the highly skilled, those who came years later were not. So uh, I said, you know, couldn't it be that the reason you're finding that the the more recent immigrants do worse than the earlier ones not be a result of assimilation, but just be the fact that the groups are just different kinds of people? Like in the Cuban example that I had in mind? (laughs) You know, exactly. And that that was really the, this is mid-1970s. That was the birth of my first paper on immigration, which was published in 85. So I moved to California. And this idea that I asked Cheswick about sort of kept floating in my head as the California was literally changing dramatically over in that period. This is the, the, mid, the early 1980s. This is after you and I had met. I moved to California. The early 1980s. And you can basically see California changing. Before 1980, California was not a particularly heavy immigrant state. And I get there, and overnight, you can sort of see the town changing, Okay. And I said to myself, this looks really interesting. It was like a major change. And I wanted to study this just out of curiosity. And the question that kept cropping in my mind was that question that I had asked at the seminar. How exactly would you measure assimilation when you have different waves of people being different? And that's what I decided to study. And that that was really my entry into immigration. And that's that's the way I got involved. And how much do you think we know now? And there are many, many examples in the book trying to measure this, but try to summarize them. Uh, what do we know now about people's ability to assimilate and, you know, whatever that means, there's, there's cultural right. and economic simula- right. assimilation, but I would, let's stick to the economic side again, right. the idea that their wages of the children and grandchildren become closer to the wages of natives. Right. Well, there's two kinds of assimilation we want to talk about. One is what happens during an immigrant's lifetime, and the other is what happens to the children and grandchildren, right? Yep. Like the whole Chiswick paper was really what happens about the immigrant's lifetime. And we know a lot more about that now than we did, you know, when Chiswick began, obviously. And what we know is that the groups of immigrants who came in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, assimilated quite well in terms of they experienced a lot of wage growth. The groups that came at the beginning of the 20th century and the groups that came at the end of the 20th century they have not experienced as much, as much wage growth, which is sort of a curious finding. Because if you look at the 20th century in the U.S., it's basically bookended by two mass migrations. And what we tend to find is that the immigrants who came during mass migrations 
don't tend to progress as fast as those who came in a period of less immigration, okay? So that's actually a very interesting sort of topic for future discussion, okay? I mean, yeah. we don't quite know why it happened, but it's interesting. Could be a supply it, effect, could be something different, could be there was a big recession in 2008 that exactly. set everybody be, back. We don't, yeah. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know. I mean, I, I'd be completely honest. We don't know, but it's just a, a, very, a, very, interesting, a very interesting pattern. Uh, the second thing, which is the, what happens to the children and grandchildren, and again, the only experience we have here is what happened in the 20th century. So what we, can, we have data for is we can track the people who came in the early 1900s, look at their children, look at their grandchildren over the century, right? And what we see is that the melting pot worked. The children improve over time, and ethnic inequality, in other words, the difference between group X and group Y, narrows down a lot. And that's what you would expect from the melting pot working. Now, uh, you didn't raise the, this point, but I make this point in the book, which is the following. A lot of people look at that 20th century experience and say, look, you know, even though we're having, uh, perhaps we're having some problems today with the new immigrants, they're not, a, they're not doing so well or whatever, it all worked out in the 20th century, and therefore, you know, we can just extrapolate into the future and it'll work out fine. And this is one of the points I want to make in the book, which sort of came up in our conversation before, you know, conditions on the ground matter a lot. You cannot reproduce things that happen in one place at one time regarding immigration and um, imagine that it will happen in another place at another time. Because again, immigrants are not just robotic workers. And the example I'd like to give for the 20th century is a, sort of a few examples of the following. One is, look, when immigrants in 1900 came in, they went into the manufacturing sector. It's not too much of an exaggeration to claim that the Ellis Island era immigrants built up the manufacturing sector in the U.S. to a large extent. Now, the important thing about that is that those jobs eventually became unionized and were very high paying jobs. And those union jobs were, you know, were sort of transferred within the family. So if your father, you know, one number that I always find incredible is in 1915 or so, almost three quarters of the Ford Motor Company's workforce was foreign born. Well, just imagine if you were a Ford employee and you, you know, became unionized, got a great paying job, your children got that job, your grandchildren, and that was really the entry to the middle class in the 20th century for many immigrant families. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. example. Of course, it was harder for other people's children and grandchildren to get those jobs because the union wanted to keep them out and were exactly. eager to oh, keep the gains that's, very narrow. So they – That's exactly I right. just want to emphasize that. Less. But People. nevertheless, the fact that immigrants were so overrepresented in the, in the manufacturing sector clearly helped them. Yeah. And the question is, what's, what is it now? What conditions today will lead to that kind of assimilation path in the next 100 years? I don't know. Another question, another issue is, look, there were two wars. And the Germans, were, in particular, were highly discriminated against in World War I. A lot of states passed legislation making it legal to, to speak German in public. Uh, making it illegal to actually teach German in public schools, and that must have affected assimilation, right? And again, we don't want to have another world war, but how do you how do you reproduce those underlying conditions? And last but not least, and I think this is something you've actually talked about before uh, in some of your work, is that um, you know the, there is uh, there is the, the incentive to assimilate in culturally doesn't really exist anymore. The ideology behind assimilation doesn't really exist anymore. You know, uh, I'll give the example in the book of the University of California passing out a memo <laughs> prohibiting people from using the world melting pot <laughs> because uh, it's a microaggression. You know, just imagine what doing that means in terms of, you know, future assimilation. It's not really clear, right? Um, well, the, the example you also give in the book, which I think is fantastic and relevant, is – through most of a, a large part of American history, immigra immigrants were eager to learn the language. But, of course, it's hard to learn a new language when you're an adult. But the children right. at least would learn the language, and the, and right. the parents would often do their best uh, to speak uh, the language, the native language at home to encourage their kids. In fact, uh, my wife's uh, grandparents – came here from Germany in 1939, escaping the Nazis, and they never spoke German again. So think about how crazy – think about that house, a husband and wife not speaking the lang their native language because they right. were so uh, horrified and, and, and traumatized right. by the Holocaust. So, of course, their children 
spoke English for much better than they would have otherwise. That's of course, right. they didn't know German. That was the right. they, 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 that was the, there was a cost to that, of course. Yeah. But in today's world, we make it for reasons that are I'm not going to try to explain. We make it easier for people to not learn English. We have wonderful private and public. Um, accommodation of people where English is not their native language, obviously Spanish being the the, right. the second language. And there's something good about that and right. there's something not so good. Um, right. And look, uh, the other the other point that you can make is that there are now gains to be had by making sure you retain the ethnic identity, you know, in terms of all kinds of programs that 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 try to divide people by ethnic groups yeah. and reward people and penalize people accordingly. And that also affects assimilation. So I think the usual, you know, we all have a tendency to do this. Okay? We always look at data and uh, we always from this, you know, we always look at data from the past and we assume the world is linear and we can just extrapolate from where we are now using the data from the past, right? It's not so clear you can do this in this context. And that's one of the warnings, the warnings that, that I give in the book. Yeah, I, and I agree with that. So let me let me make a uh, a. A philosophical observation and, and see uh, where you stand on this. So I'm going to give you my summary of, of what we know about this and why I come down as I do. And, and I'm going to be as honest as I can be. So I can see that immigration is hard on low-skill workers. I think the effects are relatively small, but I can see that, that for them, small is not really the right word. It might be large to them because 5% of a poorer person still might be more significant than it might be to me. And I get that. I also believe that over the longer period of time, it leads to growth and more of better use of resources. And that's going to enhance the opportunities of their children and grandchildren, especially if we get rid of things like mandated uh, second language signs, et cetera. I think we should be encouraging people to learn English and use English. And I hope culturally we'll move toward a more assimilatory um, I think it's okay to say melting pot. I think that would I would like to see that, but I understand I don't have control over that. So I think the economic effects are relatively small, and but for me and and others, but especially uh, for me. So I concede that they're bigger for people who are not like me, but for their children and grandchildren, I think that they'll be okay with it, and I think they care about their children and grandchildren. And I see a huge benefit to the people who come here. So as somebody who's not an nth generation American. Just like you, I'm not as new as you are, but right. I have uh, my, you know, my four grandparents. One was born in Poland, and three were born in the United States. I think, but about just they're all they all came in the, in the 1880s part, and I concede the fact that I have an emotional reaction to this issue, partly because if those people hadn't come here, they would have been killed in the Holocaust, and they would have been really poor. Uh, either way, and I'm really glad that we got – that my ancestors came here, that I got to be born here instead of in Poland uh, or somewhere else. And uh, I'd like to see that opportunity available to other people. So I see the – I see it as a wonderful thing for the people who come here mostly. I see it as mostly a good thing for the people who are here. And for me, the only issue is the cultural issue. Is it, is it a net negative or a net positive uh, to have diverse people coming here who may not share all the cultural values of America. And there I'm, I do worry about the, the melting pot and assimilation, but that, that's where I stand. Where do, you, where do you stand and does your you know, personal story yeah. have, play a role in your willingness or eagerness to let – or antagonism to people coming here? You know, uh, we're not that far away, believe it or not, okay? I mean I think I would – I mean in the little summary you just gave at the very end of what you said, you sort of – didn't really talk about the people being hurt by it so much. And the question is, how much weight should we put on that? You know, one of the things at the end of the book that I have is I sort of say to myself, what would I do if I had control over immigration policy, right? And even though there is an impact on the low-skill labor market, I don't come out at the end and say, let's just stop all low-skill immigration. In fact, I say we shouldn't do that. We should actually, there's something quite, in the, in the way you put it, there's something quite historic, about the U.S. giving the opportunity to many low-skilled people from all over the world to come to this country and live, you know, much better lives, right? And I don't want it. I don't. I will never want to throw that away. That's part of what the U.S. is about. But what I think we've made the mistake on is ignoring the fact that the long run is far away, and there's a need right now to address the the dislocations 
suffered by people at that low end. And unfortunately, both in the case of trade and immigration, we tended to ignore those people. We tend to look forward and say, look, in the long term, the economic pie will go up, your children might be fine, whatever, right? But that's, you know, 20, 30 years down the line. What do we do about the people who are being hurt today? So I'm not that far away from you, but I, I would actually argue that we cannot just dismiss the short run impact uh, so willingly. I think we have to take, we have to, we have to think of immigration. If we're going to, if we're going to do these kinds of things, we have to think of immigration policy in a broader way. And that broader way is not just how many immigrants to admit and which immigrants to admit, but what to do about the people who are being hurt by it now. And once we address that, then I'm much more in your, in, I'm much more in your ballpark. And I think we have to deal with the cultural issue too. And yeah, I think oh, that's- so look, I mean, the cultural issue, look at, look at Europe right now, right? Yep. The cultural issue is at the core of all this. And it's something, you know, we wanted workers, but we got people instead. And that sort of, that sort of encapsulates what's really at stake here. Have any thoughts on what we might do to, I mean, I would argue that Europe's problems are, are much worse than the United States because for, for whatever reason, historical or policy-wise, uh, workers here in the United States are much more likely to assimilate their children and grandchildren are, I think, as well. We can debate how fast that is relative to the past. I agree with you. It probably isn't the same. But it's, we seem to be a better, doing a better job at it than, than Europe is. Um, is that just good luck? Is it? Are there things that we might do as a nation, though, to make that easier? Well, look, we've done a lot better job than Europe has in the past. And we did a lot better job than Europe did in the past by basically keeping our hands off the whole assimilation process. We let the process work. The government really, you know, we've had immigration policy, but unlike many European countries, we've never actually had an, an assimilation policy. We've never penalized it. We've never, you know, and apart from the special case like Germany and things like that, right, we've never really done, we've, the government never really has been that much involved in the process of assimilating immigrants and their children, right? Uh, and the question becomes, in today's world, uh, is that hands-off approach something that's wise or should we begin to rethink that and i actually don't have an answer for that i don't really know what the correct approach is but i think there are things the government does that reduces the incentive to assembly right they mandate oh, I certain agree. things I, I, agree. And I, I think i think from the point of view of the country assimilation is a great thing i think taking actions and putting in policies that retard assimilation or that encourage ethnic ethnic identity to remain generation after generation is not a good thing in the long term, okay? But, um, you know, I mean, I wish I had like a magic wand to sort of pass by and return to the, in, you know, one great example of this is that if you think, if you think of, uh, like talk about your grandparents, uh, you think about the public school system in New York City back in 1900, 1910, 1920, you know, their goal was to make all these immigrant kids Americans, okay? Yeah. They taught in the language, and they were going to come out like American kids, right? Yep. Uh, you say that today in a school and you get fired. Yeah. And that's a problem. That's a problem we have to address. And those kids desperately wanted to be American, you know. Exactly. They, they, they were eager to leave behind their, their customs and traditions uh, yeah. often. And yep. it's it's been a fascinating ride when you think about the that the ethnic pride that that we have now and the negatives about that in terms of seeing us each separate versus part of the same, same thing is that there's a terror, there's a trade out there that's unavoidable. Right. Uh, and certainly maybe we've reached a tipping point where now people don't want to be a quote American. They want to be something American, whatever yeah. it is. And, and, <laughs> and like in University of California said, if you say micro, if you say melting pot, you've, you've done it, you've, you know, you've conducted a microaggression. Yeah, that's a fascinating, how, how that came to be, of course, is, is, is unknowable. It's an emergent phenomenon, but that's where we are. Now, I think you would, you would argue, I assume that that's a reality we have to accept. That's right. We can't change that easily. And we need to take that into account when we think about it. And, and, uh, and, and, and the important thing for policy is you really have to take that into account before you let in two million people, for example, like Germany did. You know, it's not something you can ignore. 
My guest today has been George Borjas. Uh, the book is We Wanted Workers. George, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. Okay. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.